Welcome, welcome, everybody. It is July 3rd, and this is Gettysburg 157. I'm Gary Edelman. You're with the American Battlefield Trust, and we're going to be going all around today, just like we have the last two days, trying to bring you the Gettysburg commemoration, the 157th of which I've almost been to one-fifth now. So uh, I hope I live long enough to maybe get to a, a third of them before I'm dead. I know you wanted to know that. We are at Spangler Spring, okay? And we've got a lot of setup to do. We haven't been on this side of the line yet, um, and I think you know the 10 roads coming to Gettysburg, and the most important life line for the Union Army by the afternoon of July 2nd, late afternoon of July 2nd, is the Baltimore Pike. See, the long Confederate line that surrounds the Union fishhook position controls eight of the ten roads. All the Yankees have is the sort of muddy dirt Tawny Town Road or the improved crushed white limestone Baltimore Pike. The Baltimore Pike is just about uh, uh, 240 yards off in that direction. You might be able to see a car here and there as you gaze in the distance toward Powers Hill. Incidentally, you, the members of this organization, help to preserve most of Powers Hill as well as the trees that you see right there in the distance. If you walked through those, you'd be on the Baltimore Pike. If you went another 150 yards, you'd be at the uh, Museum and Visitor Center. So we're not that far away and eventually paths will connect all this. Yes, you'll be able to walk easily to Culp's Hill and Spangler Spring from the Visitor Center. The fighting here on Culp's Hill doesn't get a lot of attention um, because it's a little bit confusing. Culp's Hill is two hills, an upper hill and a lower hill. Uh, guess what they're called? Upper Culp's Hill and Lower Culp's Hill. And there's fighting over two days here, okay? And in summary, on July 2nd, 1863, the Union is up there with the 12th Corps under Slocum or Williams. There are six brigades up there, five of which are moved over toward the Union left to bail out Sickles. Most of them don't arrive, but... That leaves only one brigade up on Culp's Hill. We're going to talk about this in more detail, and that is the brigade of George Sears Green and his New Yorkers. They have earthworks. They can stop the Confederates from getting the top, and they do, but the Southerners capture not upper but lower Culp's Hill during the fighting on July 2nd. Then, on July 3rd, Confederates send reinforcements here. The Union sends reinforcements on top of the five brigades that return, and there's going to be a seven-hour fight for this area, Lower Culp's Hill, Upper Culp's Hill, and this area, Spangler Spring and Spangler's Meadow. This fight is known for a lot of reasons. There's friendly fire going on around here. You have a Union soldier threatening to turn his regiment around and capture some of the cannons um, on Powers Hill, friendly cannons, because the shells kept dropping among them. But I think this is most well known for an ill-fated charge of two regiments, one from Indiana and one from Massachusetts, and they're gonna charge across this meadow. The commander of the two units nominally together is a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Charles Mudge, okay? Mudge, it didn't sound right to him. He knew the Confederates were strongly posted off in that direction, okay? Um, so he went to have the order confirmed, and the order came back as confirmed. And he famously said, well, it's murder, but it's the order. Up, man, over the works. And he leads them over the works. In the meantime, it seems like the 27th Indiana moves off in that direction across a meadow over there. The 27th only makes it a third of the way or halfway across the field before they are stopped with more than 35% casualties. Then, the second Massachusetts moves in toward these rocks, okay, where they're able to get a flanking fire on some of the Confederates over there, and where they're going to continue the fight. And Charles Mudge is among them. And to talk a little bit more about Mudge and to show us something super cool, let me bring on Wayne Moss, CEO of the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and our good friend. Thanks, Gary. I appreciate it very much. Thanks, everyone. And I'm very happy on behalf of the Civil War Museum to be with you. On July 3rd, 1863, as Gary mentioned, in the morning, Colonel Mudge charges right across the field right in this area. And one of the things that he had here at Gettysburg is this very unique officer's mess kit. And I, I really, really like it. It has his name written right on it, Charles R. Mudge. So you can zoom in on it. And it has Swamp Scott, Massachusetts, which is where uh, Colonel Mudge was from. So he was 23 years old here during the Battle of Gettysburg. He's born uh, in New York City. And on July 3rd, he's actually shot through the throat, charging right across here where we are, and he's killed almost instantly. His body is taken back to Massachusetts to be buried. But this would have been either on his person or in his haversack when he was killed here at Gettysburg. It has a knife, fork, and spoon. And what's really unique about it, let's see if I can get it out. Get Maybe, it Gary, you could just kind of hold that for me real there quick. Go, the mask. I noticed the bottle opener for, yeah. uh, for an officer. He's <laughs> yeah, got important. a wine cork in it. He's yeah. got a wine cork in it. But look at the salt shaker in this. Look at the salt shaker in this. So these aren't issued because Mudge is an officer. He has to buy this. This is not uh, given to him. But what an, an interesting artifact uh, that we have at the National Civil War Museum belonging uh, to Charles Mudge. And I think somehow this humanizes him a little, right? He is an officer, right? He's commanding soldiers, and yet he has a salt shaker with him. 
uh, because you know what? People like salt on their food. It's that easy. So, uh, Wayne, this is just one of the incredible objects you have with you today, and I can't wait to see what else you brought. I appreciate it very much. Thanks, Gary. Uh, while we're at it, uh, make sure you check out the National Civil War Mu Museum's YouTube channel and subscribe to that channel. That is after you've subscribed to the channel of the American Battlefield <laughs> Trust. Um, thanks so much, Wayne. So, you bet. so, you know, Mudge will pay the ultimate price. He knew something was wrong with this order. It was confirmed, but he's a soldier. He has to obey orders. So, and, you know, these units are actually filled with soldiers who have to do exactly that. The whole armies are filled with people just like that. They're human. They're just like us, but they have to, you know, and they may question things, but they have to ultimately do what they are told. And we're going to bring on Dr. Carol Reardon here. Maybe we can walk a little toward her to talk just about some of these soldiers on here. Carol, by the way, um, your professor at Gettysburg College, long time. You know her already. I'll stop there. <laughs> Carol? Hi there. I understand some of you have been asking about me. Well, here I am. Glad to be with you this morning with the American Battlefield Trust. One of the things that kind of interests me right at the moment is um, how to get more of you to come back here. It's easy for those of you in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, New York to come down and visit us again. But basically, we want the whole world to come and visit us sooner or later. And one of the reasons we, why we want you to do that is to, uh, so that you don't break faith with uh, an awful lot of your countrymen who have already been here. When we think about Gettysburg, we think about the Irishmen who, are, who come here. And we think about the Germans who served here. But there are an awful lot of, of representatives from the rest of the world who come here and are here on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. And I want to tell you about one of those folks because he was in this charge that, that Colonel Mudge led and Colonel Mudge, in, in which Colonel Mudge fell. His name is George T. Chase. Um, sounds like a good upstanding Massachusetts farmer, and in 1861, that's exactly what he was doing. He was a farmer in Lynn, Massachusetts, and when the call to arms came at the end of May 1861, he was one of the first to sign on the bottom line and became a soldier in Company F of the 2nd Massachusetts. He was a very steady soldier. He uh, was always in ranks when called. At the Battle of Chancellorsville, just a couple months before Gettysburg, he was wounded, but he rebounded so quickly that on July 3rd, 1863, he is in ranks and he is ready for service. So when Colonel Mudge goes, it's murder, but it's the order, let's go, um, George Chase is, is, ready, is, is ready to go. At that point, he is first sergeant of Company F, so he has proven himself a good and steady soldier. In the fighting here in um, the fields around Spangler Spring, um, sergeant Chase is going to be wounded in the shoulder. It's a bad wound. He's going to be taken back to the 12th Corps headquarters, or 12th Corps hospital. And he's going to be taken care of as well as they possibly can, and he will survive the wound, but not enough to come back on active duty full time. For a while, he's going to go into the Veteran Reserve Corps and serve in its unique uh, bird's egg blue uniform. But ultimately, even before the war is over, he's going to uh, find a way to get a a commission in the 20th Massachusetts and serve in the last months of the war as a commissioned officer. After the war is over, he's going to go back to Massachusetts and he's going to return to his farm in Lynn. But the war has taken its toll on him. He's multiple, been wounded multiple times. He's seen a lot of action. And in 1867, he dies. In 1867, the second Massachusetts would be one of the first regiments to publish a regimental history. And you know how we love regimental histories when the soldiers who actually fought compile their records and preserve for all posterity what they did on fields like this, this place here at Gettysburg. It's a great story and it's neat because it is so written when the memories are so fresh. In the back of the book, they have the roster of the regiment. And among the other details that they provide is where these soldiers came from. We know that in the great charge of the, of the second Massachusetts, that there were Irishmen in the, in the ranks. At least two of the color bearers, um, Stephen Cody and Rupert Sadler, were, were from, uh, from Ireland to begin with. At least two uh, young men from Germany, Fritz Goetz and John Durr, fell in these fields around here as privates. Uh, one of their corporals was an immigrant from Scotland. But as I was looking at the roster, George Chase's name just jumped off the page because he wasn't simply that farmer from Lynn, Massachusetts. The regimental history records it for us. And when you run across these little facts that just sort of make you stop and go, what? Well, this was one of those moments. For George Chase, his road to Gettysburg did not begin in Lynn, Massachusetts. It began in the place of his birth, which was listed back then as Cape Town, Cape of Good Hope. First Sergeant George Chase 
who was wounded here at Gettysburg, his road to Gettysburg began in South Africa. Who saw that coming? Well, he's not the only one to come from quite some distance to have a meeting with a bullet here at Gettysburg. We're, we, we, might, we might meet a few more before this morning is out. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Uh, that's great, and, and it is true. I mean, it's so easy to broad brush these soldiers who are on both sides right here. You know, you may have an impression of what a northern soldier is, what a southern soldier is, but their lives are as diverse and as complex as ours, and it's important to keep that in mind. So you're with the American Battlefield Trust. We're, this is our Gettysburg 157 live coverage. We're at Spangler Spring, and we've just been visiting with Wayne Motts and Carol Reardon. And while looking at this, I was checking comments for some of our other videos, and we have people from Sweden and from Ireland uh, watching, as well as somebody here watching us film this, who's actually uh, watching one of our other videos at that time. Is that Joe over there? Uh, uh, there he is over there. So um, come follow me, Chris. Oh God, there he is standing in the white shirt. It almost looks like an American Battlefield Trust t-shirt. I think it might be. So um, you can get all your Battlefield swag at battlefields.org. Battlefields.org slash shop, I think specifically. So um, here we are uh, just tying up a little bit about what's going on here. To, to talk about this place for only 20 minutes is an absolute crime because this is the most sustained fighting at Gettysburg. It goes on for seven hours where Union and Confederate soldiers battled mostly for Lower Culp's Hill that you see right here. But then it goes up there and it crests and it goes down again through a saddle and it goes up to Upper Culp's Hill. There is fighting here for seven hours, like I said. Ultimately, the Union will wrest Lower Culp's Hill back from the Confederates. And uh, that's why you see mostly Union monuments and markers on that particular hill. So here we are going up toward Spangler Spring. Now, Spangler Spring did not look like this during the battle, nor did it look like some of the older pictures you see of it. In fact, it was more of a hole in the ground. But one day in something like the 1840s or 1850s, a guy named Henry Staley, he was a newspaper editor here, started poking in the ground with uh, right here with a stick and he found that up bubble clean clear pollution not polluted water that came out people started picnicking here because the waters of Spangler Spring were so well known there's a bunch of Spangler family members around here at the time so by the time of the Civil War this was just sort of like a leafy muddy uh, hole but fresh water was bubbling up from it um, here on the night of July 2nd, the myth goes that Union and Confederate soldiers gathered here and forgot their differences and fraternized around the cool waters of Spangler Spring. And this is how battles end and history goes, right? Were there soldiers here from both sides at the same time? Yes. Um, did they know, however, that they were with the enemy? Absolutely not. The idea that they're going to stop fighting and just hang out for a while um, just isn't realistic, and the records don't support it. We have three accounts of people being here at the same time, and all of them had no idea in the confused darkness as both sides were coming down on that dark night, um, had no idea that the enemy was near, and there were a bunch of captures in this area. Very chaotic. Now, after the Civil War, let's see how the shadows line up for us here. Look, Chris is getting out of the thing. Thanks, Chris White behind the camera there. Ooh, that worked really well. Uh, just focus on them in general. I'll lead you over. When you look over here, what you can see are maybe two springs, an upper spring and a lower spring, maybe one for horses, maybe one not. I'm told that the upper spring didn't have much water in it anyway. And when you start looking at photos of Spangler Spring after it had been walled in over the years, you start to see pictures of people drinking from a tin cup. Okay, and over time, you start to realize that that tin cup is in the same pictures. In fact, the tin cup just lives here. You might be able to see it hanging out there, okay? Eventually, you can see it in all these pictures. I've identified it in more than 25 pictures. And then eventually, the U.S. government said, hey, maybe that's not such a good idea um, to have, you know, thousands of people drinking out of the same cup. That's particularly of interest to us right now, considering the pandemic that we are in. So they actually hung a dipper right here. And then they put a sign up here that said, warning, use dipper to fill your cup. Do not drink from dipper or dip your dip, dip your cup into the spring, okay? Eventually, they even went further and brought Boy Scouts here with Dixie Cups. Um, there we go. Dixie Cups, you can see he has a little holder there, and you can't see it here, but trust me, right in the side of the spring, there was actually a Dixie Cup dispenser, okay? Um, so they eventually got it, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more sanitary. Here's the incredible part, and probably the most worthless piece of information I'll ever share on one of these. If you look closely enough into the canopy of this particular uh, uh, structure, and this was put here with leftover stone from the 44th New York Monument. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, it's not Albany granite. It's Prospect Hill, Maine granite. Uh, and you can see it looks just like the 44th. Um, you can still see the anchors from the sign that said, uh, warning, use dipper. You can find the anchor for the dipper. And 
the anchors from the Dixie Cup dispenser, and I know some of you, the biggest nerds watching, might be interested in this. To tie this up a little bit, uh, Spangler Spring was spring water until the 1930s where there was a terrible drought. So what did they do? It was so popular, the town couldn't deal with it. They worked with the park and they ran a water line across East Cemetery Hill, through Culp's Hill, and all the way to right here. And you started drinking Gettysburg town water. The next year, the drought ended. This place absolutely filled up with spring water. They've been trying to manage the water ever since. Then eventually they put a water fountain here, which I got to drink from. It was here until 1991. And you could drink the not pellucid waters of Spangler Spring, but rather, Gettysburg Borough Town Water at Spangler Spring. So we hope you've enjoyed this uh, little foray into Spangler Spring. Thanks to Carol. Thanks to Wayne. Thank you all for watching. And of course, thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.